As I mentioned, I, I first met, uh, and the only time I ever met Phyllis Shafley was close to 30 years ago, I think, in Phoenix, Arizona. <clears throat> and I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years. I moved there straight from Boston, my very first experience living away from the Northeast. Talk about a, talk about a culture shock. Uh, and I learned very quickly in, in Arizona that there are some very colorful public figures, primarily in law enforcement, well, the politics and the sort. Sheriff Mackler, remember this? I was there during the uh, Evan Meekum days. So there were, there were a few colorful folks in, uh, in Arizona politics. One of those folks through the generations who's been a very colorful and very active conservative is a former sheriff of Graham County, Arizona, Sheriff Richard Mack, who took states' rights all the way to the United States Supreme Court and won, sued over the Brady Bill, and is a firm believer in the role of the county sheriff and the county in protecting our rights and fighting the tentacles of Agenda 21, which reaches all the way from the United Nations into our local counties, into our local towns. If you own a farm or if you own a piece of property, it reaches all the way to your piece of property. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring to the podium right now from Arizona, former Graham County, Arizona Sheriff, <laughs> television and radio personality, <laughs> Sheriff Richard Mack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Um, he left out one thing. Uh, when I sued the federal government, it was the Clinton administration, and I lived to tell about it. You know? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's really uh, heartwarming to be here in the same room with Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, she doesn't remember when we first met. It was back in 1975, and she spoke at Eastern Arizona College, where I attended at the time. And it was an outdoor event, uh, so I went voluntarily to hear this wonderful woman speak. And it was a, a time in my life where I was still deciding uh, where I stood politically. And uh, she had a hand in uh, getting me over that fence a little bit. <laughs> Um, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't born in a, a constitutional home or a conservative home. Uh, you know, my parents voted, I think, uh, I remember them talking about voting for Nixon against Kennedy, and that's about all I remember. And I know they like Reagan, uh, but that's about the extent of my home. And so I had to find a lot of these things out on my own, and I certainly did from, from you. And. Uh, Another one that came into my life, uh, I, you see folks, I just wanted to be in law enforcement. That's all I wanted to do. I would never planned on being an activist. When I ran for county sheriff in Arizona, where uh, that was a dream come true, being elected in my old hometown where I grew up as the county sheriff. I did not run on a platform that, I will sue Bill Clinton <laughs> and we will stop the incursions of the federal government. That, that was the furthest thing from my mind. But there came a time in my law enforcement career where I decided I was going to quit my job or I had to find out what law enforcement was for and why I was a cop. And I ran smack in the face of the oath of office that I took. And I decided that at that time, that it was either keep my oath or quit my job. And I actually was going to quit my job because I didn't think it was possible to stay in law enforcement and actually keep your oath to uphold and defend, protect, preserve, and obey the United States Constitution. And then I had a, an imaginary uh, confrontation or little get together with my wife. And uh, I imagine telling her that I just quit my job that day because <laughs> I was a liar and a hypocrite and I couldn't keep my oath of office, so I'm quitting. And she goes, well, let me get this straight, Mac. You quit your job today because you're a liar and a hypocrite. That's right. I'm sorry. I'll get another job, I promise. 
And uh, so we can't pay the house payment, we can't pay the car payment, and we can't get the kids new school clothes, all because you're a liar and hypocrite. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she goes, you couldn't consider just uh, keeping your job and quit being a liar and a hypocrite? And I said, thank the good Lord for a good wife. And do you see how smart you ladies are? You win the argument and you're not even there. And that's just, that, that's the kind of influence my wife had on me. And so I kept my job and went down to briefing. And after briefing, I went home. And there's the pretty little blonde girl. She goes, what are you doing home? And I said, I'm checking out the Word Book Encyclopedia. She goes, to go on shift? And I said, yeah, the one that says US Constitution. You see, none of you right-wingers had given me a little pocket constitution yet. So I had to have, keep this great big old book in my patrol car. And when I wasn't on another call, I was reading the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And I decided that this was a wonderful thing. It was easy to understand. And the Eighth Amendment had a huge impact on my life because if you read the Eighth Amendment, no excessive fine or bail, nor cruel and unusual punishment, writing traffic tickets is all three. It violates all three principles. Okay? And I want you to come back and get my materials afterwards. I've got my books here. And in this little book, The Proper Role of Law Enforcement, I put a Sheriff Mackism in here because I call ticket writing taxation through citation. Okay? That's what it is. Okay? And um, <clears throat> so at this time that I'm having this epiphany occur in my life where I'm starting to love the Constitution, an announcement comes on the briefing bulletin board of the Provo Police Department where I was working. And it said, the state of Utah Peace Officer Standards and Training is offering a training seminar entitled Constitutional Studies for Law Enforcement Officers. And I said, man, what a great idea. And I said to myself, I'm going. It's a two-day seminar at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And the reason I'm going is because the instructor's name at the bottom of the page was none other than Dr. W. Cleon Skousen. And that, during that two days of 16 hours of police training, I was converted. The conversion was complete. And you know, in 16 hours of police training, we didn't study the Miranda decision or the Carroll Doctrine or Terry versus Ohio or why we should learn how to shoot a gun better. We studied the making of America and his book that he handed each one of us, 240 big tough cops, all get his book personally signed by him. And he and I kind of struck up a friendship during breaks and things because he used to work in the FBI with my father. And when he handed me his book, uh, I was so touched. And I felt the strength of this man. And he wasn't very good looking, and he wasn't very big, but he spoke with the power of God. And I learned that day that the power of God is the spirit of freedom. And I took another oath, and I said, I will never be on the wrong side again. And I continued on. <clears throat> I continued on with my law enforcement career, and uh, things started really going great for us. And you know what happens when things are going great in your life. The in-laws call. <laughs> my wife's parents are calling us and lobbying us to move home to Arizona and run for sheriff in Graham County, where both my wife and I are from. And I've had 11 years on with Provo Police Department, and I said, there's no way. I said, I'll, I can retire in nine years. I'll, I'll move home then and run for sheriff. Oh, no, we're, we're going to have a horrible sheriff here. We're going to have a corrupt sheriff. You've got to come home and save us. And, um, and I told him, no way, that this is not going to happen. Everything's going fine. I'm just, I just made sergeant, um, and then I just made detective. And I'm really happy with my career. The kids are all happy. And I'm, we're not moving home. So far, this is the first time in our married lives that my wife agreed with me that her parents were crazy. 
And um, so every time they call, I would just hand her the phone. And, and so she told them to stop calling. So they had other people call. <laughs> and so finally I told my wife, I said, look, let's just end this right now. Let's stop all these calls. Let's just list all the pros and cons as to why we're not going to move home and run for sheriff. We can't. And any reasonable person's going to read all those pros and cons and leave us alone. Well, I guess we, I didn't know her parents that well. So. <laughs> and so anyway, we listed all the reasons. And there was 23 reasons why we could not do this. And only two reasons why it might be a good idea. And we sent that down to him. And it was about three weeks later. We moved home and ran for sheriff. <laughs> and my dear friends, I have to tell you, that's the gospel truth. And I guess nobody else would have thought of it. But that's what happened. And to this day, I don't know why I did such a crazy thing. I was elected in 1988. I was re-elected in 1992. And in 1993, I know this is going to really shock you. And I hope this doesn't hurt you. Or destroy your faith in Washington, D.C. politics. But somebody in Washington started lying about the Brady Bill. And it was Bill Clinton. And uh, he said, when they signed the Brady Bill into law in November of 1993, he used 13 pens, and I still don't remember the significance of that. But he said to the American people that the Brady Bill is going to make us so safe in America that even our nation's police officers will no longer need to carry guns. <laughs> now, am I going to sue Bill Clinton over that? No, I just took it for what it was worth. More Washington, D.C. entertainment. But then, on January 21st, 1994, we're having a Sheriff's Association meeting in Phoenix. There's only 15 counties in Arizona. There's 12 sheriffs at the meeting, but there's three strangers. And they're all agents of the BATF, ATF, Al Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And they hand us each a document, and they tell each sheriff, they tell us all, these are your marching orders as to what you each have to do to comply with the Brady Bill. You will conduct criminal and mental history background checks on everybody in your county who wishes, wishes to purchase a handgun. And you will pay for it all. And you will use your departments for federal bidding. There's no money attached. Oh, and by the way, and folks, let me remind you, this is the first time in United States history where an unfunded mandate carried with it a threat of arrest if we failed to comply. First time ever. And all the sheriffs in the room were outraged. And you never heard so much cussing in your life. And these guys left the room and all the sheriffs said, no way, cussing, you don't cuss. And they totally, all of them convinced me. I was the youngest sheriff in the state at the time. And they totally convinced me, there's no way I could go along with this. And then five hours later, they all kind of go around the table, what do you want to do about it? Every one of them acquiesced. They said, well, you can't fight City Hall. I hate it, I don't want to do it, but you can't fight City Hall. Who wants you to believe that? City Hall. Especially the one in Washington, D.C. And so I told the other guys, I told the other sheriffs, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I said, there's no way I can go along with this. You guys already convinced me. There's no way. I've already decided I'm not going to do it. But what do I do? I'm facing a threat of arrest if I don't go along. I don't know. What am I going to do? I have five kids. I've got the pretty little blonde girl at home. And so I have a three-hour drive to get back to uh, Graham County from Phoenix. And I decide that I'm not going to comply and I'm not going to quit my job. And so, but what do I do? How do I get out from underneath it? So by the time I drove up in my driveway, it hit me and it scared me to death. I'm gonna sue my own government. I'm gonna sue the Clinton administration. Do you really think I was just jumping for joy at that point? I was scared. Some small town sheriff from southeastern Arizona is gonna take on the federal government? David only wins in the Bible, even then, very seldom. <laughs> I wasn't holding out a lot of hope here. In fact, now the scariest thing, I got to go in and tell the pretty little blonde girl. And so I walk up to her and I said, I'm going to sue the federal government and I don't know what is going to happen, but I'm sure they're going to squash me like a little pumpkin seed and it's a Clinton administration. I hope you don't mind. 
And she just kind of goes, what are you talking about? And I said, I have to sue the federal government. And it's going to cost us everything. Everything. Home, job, career, everything. What do you think? <laughs> and she goes, I'm sure I don't understand what you're talking about. But I understand you. And she goes, maybe this is why you were supposed to be sheriff. And I said, I'm going to take that as a yes. And she just shrugged her shoulders and went around, went about taking care of the kids or whatever she was doing at the time. And the next morning, I don't know what to do. I never took Sue the Federal Government 101. <laughs> and so I wasn't a member of anything. I mean, I wasn't a member of it. So I don't have a national organization behind me who I can call, get your lawyer, I need him. But my undersheriff walked in and he go, and I knew he was a member of the NRA and I said, Mike, does the NRA have a number you can call and get advice? He goes, yeah, I don't know what you're gonna get. So I called him and I landed in the office of Richard Gardner, he was a lawyer. I told him who I was and what I wanted to do and he said, Sheriff, we've already been preparing the paperwork on this case and we've been praying that you would call. And I said, wonderful, let's do it. I told him I, I, I really appreciated their financial support and everything else that they were offering to help me with. I said, but I want my own lawyer. And I said, I want this to be my case, not the NRA's case. And he said, fine, we'll work with your lawyer, no problem. And I said, can you recommend one out in Arizona? <laughs> and he did. Dave Hardy in Tucson, Arizona. He used to work for us. I called Hardy, retained him as my personal lawyer on this case, and on February 28th, 1994, the very day the Brady Bill took effect, we filed, my lawyer with the NRA lawyers filed in federal district court in Tucson, Arizona. In the courtroom of one Judge John M. Roll. You see, Judge Roll was murdered this year on January 8th in Tucson. Very, very good man and had a huge impact on my life. If, he hadn't been, if it hadn't been for him, this case would have never made it to the Supreme Court. Every time the federal government pulled a shenanigan and the Justice Department and Janet Reno were trying to remove me from the case by, for standing and anything else they could try to throw at us, Judge Roll stood behind me. And on page, this is my first book for my cold dead fingers. On page 18, or 19, I'm sorry, Judge Roll says this about the Mac versus U.S. case. The court finds that in acting section 18, the Brady Bill, Congress exceeded its authority. Have you ever heard a federal judge tell Congress they exceeded their authority? Under Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, thereby impermissibly encroaching upon the powers retained by the states pursuant to the Tenth Amendment. This was all a Tenth Amendment challenge. It wasn't a Second Amendment challenge at all. My motivation for filing was definitely the Second Amendment, but we only had a chance to win on states' rights. And this was all because I knew that the President of the United States and Congress cannot tell your sheriff what to do. As a matter of fact, they can't tell anybody in your state to do a dang thing. They have no, author they have no authority. So, now, this over at the table is just something you should also have with your pocket constitution. This is a synopsis of my case, and we're going to go over some of it in this. Now, we don't have very much time tonight, so I'm just going to show you a few highlights of this, but if you want me to come back to your area and show you this whole thing, but make sure you keep this in your pocket. They're over my table. There's, you can get three for five bucks. And... This is the most powerful little tool because if you've ever argued with anybody about the federal government not having authority, you can now show them the Mac Prince case, Prince being the sheriff from Montana, who he and I both went to the United States Supreme Court together on this case. If you want to show them proof positive that the federal government cannot tell us what to do in any regard, you got to show anybody you can this case. We need to get this to every state legislator, don't we? We need to get this to every county commissioner. We need to get it to every sheriff. And 
Uh, my book, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope, has gotten to every sheriff in America. But we've got some new sheriffs, and we've got to get those guys going, too. And I'm going to talk to you about some sheriffs that are actually fighting and showing that they can be constitutional sheriffs. We have the wife of one here in the room today, Mrs. Dean Wilson. And is, what county is it? What county? Del North. Del North. Okay, we're good. So, so I'm going to show you a few things that are part of the case. I want, I'm an investigator. I want to show you the proof. I don't want you just to hear me. I want you to see what the Supreme Court, how the Supreme Court took us through a history lesson of the Tenth Amendment and of the impotency of the federal government. And the Article 1, Section 8 is the only place they get any authority, any sovereignty. And that these are discrete, enumerated powers, as reiterated by Justice Scalia, who wrote this decision. Now, go ahead, right arrow. Let's go next. One more. Uh, one more. Let's keep going. Okay, there's the oath of office. This is what hit me. Do you know that in every oath, no matter California or New York or Bangor, Maine or Hawaii, the United States Constitution is always first. Always. Next one. Do you know why we take an oath of office? It's required, the Founding Fathers required it of every single solitary public official. Look at this. The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures. So we have the legislative branch now of, uh, throughout the entire state and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. So the Founding Fathers wanted all three branches to have the same purpose. And what is that? The Constitution. And so what did Scalia do? Did he try, try to uh, interpret the law? No, that's not his job. Whoever told you courts were supposed to interpret the law didn't know what he was talking about or he was lying. They have to do the same thing the rest of us do. Uphold, defend, and obey the United States Constitution. That's what your judges are supposed to do. And Scalia sets a tremendous example of that in this case. Next one. Let's keep going. State nullification. Did I make that up? Of course not. Thomas Jefferson said when he was vice president that the states should judge the authority of the, of the federal government's laws and decrees. The constitutionality of the federal government's laws and decrees. Whose job is it to judge that? The states. Next one. And he said that the states should refuse to enforce any law that was unconstitutional. And that's what I decided on the Brady Bill. I'm not going to enforce this. They're putting me in a quandary that I can't live with, obey an unconstitutional law, or break my oath of office. So next one. Madison sums state nullification up into one category, and that's interposition, the theory or doctrine of interposition, and that your state legislature, and that your state and county and city employees, even your school boards, are duty-bound to interpose themselves and interpose their power on behalf of the people to make sure you're not being victimized by the government. And it doesn't matter which government it is. Next one. These are the two sheriffs in this case, Prince and Mac. Next one. Then look at this. This is Judge Roll again. Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the law. Don't you wish that every law enforcement official, every county official, would see this and say, do you know what? You do not have to violate your oath to support stupid laws. And Edmund Burke said, the enforcement of stupid laws is the essence of tyranny. And so we don't have to go along with all this. We have to keep our oath and our word. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one, next one. Here's the threat of arrest. Under a separate provision of the Gun Control, Gun Control Act, any person who knowingly violates the section of the Gun Control Act amended by uh, the Brady Bill shall be fined under this title, imprisoned for no more than one year or both. 
We actually got, my attorney said, I think we should try to get an injunction against the Justice Department and the Clinton administration from being able to arrest you while we're in court for failure to comply. Janet Reno wrote a memo to the judge, to Judge Roll, and said that Congress didn't really mean this to apply to the sheriffs, they, the Cleos, they call us the Cleos. This is one case where there is absolute proof that the sheriff is the Cleo, chief law enforcement officer, okay? And, ja and, and Judge Roll said, Janet Reno isn't allowed to change the law or interpret the law for Congress. Matt gets his injunction. I think I was the only person in history to get an injunction for Bill Clinton on a non-sexual matter. Let's go. <laughs> next one. Okay. Now, next one. Okay, show that real quick. Right, we're going to cut it about halfway through. front seats. You see, my dear friends, I still, every time I see this, cannot wrap my mind around this at all. In America, a citizen was arrested December 1st, 1955, Montgomery, Alabama, for not giving her seat to a white man. And you see, this makes it so much more applicable today when you see that we're still doing the same thing. You see, we do it to farmers because they want to sell raw milk. If you look on my website, you'll see me drinking raw milk in Madison, Wisconsin with two farmers there who had their farms raided and destroyed by local officials just protecting the public. One, thing pro one problem with protecting the public, not one person had ever been damaged by their milk or their cheese. And these men, I didn't know them before, but they're my brothers now. And you see, today we have constitutional sheriffs that will make sure Rosa Parks does not go to jail. You see, what should have happened here is a couple of deputies did go and arrest her, but what should have happened is the sheriff should have come on that bus. And he should have gone up to Mrs. Parks and go, ma'am, just what seems to be the problem here? And she goes, why can't we just be left alone? And he goes, you know what? You're right. And he sits down next to her and he shakes her hand and he said, Mrs. Parks, what you did here took a lot of courage. And if you don't mind, it would be an honor for me and my deputy to escort you home and make sure you get home safely. And they take her home. And he knows that there could be trouble in the town by, because of this. And trouble for him because he's defending her. And, and you see, my dear friends, a constitutional sheriff does not enforce stupid laws. Not then, not today. And right then, somebody in uniform should have protected her. Somebody with a badge who took an oath to our God-given rights should have made sure Mrs. Parks got home safely. And a man today with a badge and a uniform should be doing the same thing for Rosa Parks the farmer, or Rosa Parks the homeschooler, or Rosa Parks the gun owner, or Rosa Parks the rancher, or Rosa Parks the American who simply wants to be left alone. Now, next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. We're going to, okay, right here. 
This is, the first big, this is the first big statement by Scalia in the Mac Prince case. We have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. Don't you wish your state legislature knew that? Yeah. Well, that's up to you, isn't it? Yeah. You better make sure they know it. Because this, and just give them a little, show it. Show them the case. I actually spoke before the Oklahoma state legislature about this and we're getting across the country as best we can. I, I gotta tell you right now, there's a lot of miracles happening. I just came from Grant County, Oregon, and the sheriff there is battling the Forest Service. And he's standing up to them, and he's telling them they don't have authority there. And now the one in Josephine County, Oregon, is doing the same thing. And we've got a sheriff now, Sheriff Dean Wilson, doing the same. And he's spreading out. And now Sheriff Giddings in Idaho is doing the same thing. And we've got other sheriffs in Utah doing the same thing. And now it's getting bigger and better and faster. And every one of those sheriffs has a copy of the book, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. And every one of these sheriffs doing this have heard my class. And they're starting to be friends with me. And they're starting to see that there's a lot more to do in their job than just taste and drug runners and that protecting freedom is more important than anything else now the sheriff in um, the sheriff in Grant County maybe you've heard of Grant County somewhere I think I think uh, the new American had something about this because Grant County the people therein voted Grant County a UN free zone yeah And now the sheriff is standing up, and he's the, he's the first sheriff in the country that ever heard my Constitution class for cops. And you see all this? You can't read any of that, can you? It's too small because there's too many. This is, we support our sheriff and the names of people in the community listed all there, about 600 people. And you see, that's how we change America there. Are you catching the vision? You see all how all this happened? Do you know how all these books got out to people? Because of the Tea Party movement, and because of Eagle Forum movement, and because of JBS did an article about this book about a year and a half ago, best article ever written about my book, and it's starting to move. And there's other people like uh, Steve Hempling and, and Dr. Stan and others that are promoting this and have had me on their shows and had me at their conventions and I can't even remember where I am half the time. Tomorrow I, I, I leave at five o'clock to go speak in Kalispell, Montana the, tomorrow afternoon. And, and so this is moving folks. It's working. And how do we take back America? Well, I have to, I have to show you something about this book here. The, you know who wrote the foreword to my first book? Patrick Henry. And it's his famous, give me liberty or give me death speech. And he sounds like he's talking to us. And maybe he was. Contrary to the liberal view that they couldn't have known what we're facing today, so of course we need gun control. I know, he says, I know of no way of judging the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been to justify the hopes with which you all have in dealing with the present federal government. Now I paraphrase there, didn't I? I have to ask each of you, what is it that gives you hope that there's anything related to freedom that can happen in Washington, D.C.? What is it that has happened in Washington, D.C. that gives you any hope that voting for another Democrat or Republican is gonna change anything in that cesspool of corruption? But I can tell you right now, we can take back America county by county and state by state and the whole thing is right here and it's right here in this case because we wake people up to the issue and to the solution focus on the solution that state sovereignty is right here in our hands you can deal with three or four people in your county your sheriff and a couple of county commissioners or you can deal with 535, 550 corrupt politicians in Washington, D.C. That has gotten us nowhere. We have to start in our own backyards. This is a grassroots effort. That's what the Tea Party is. That's what you are. That's what we are. There is a solution to what's going on. And we have sheriffs that can make 
Washington, D.C., irrelevant, and there's not one thing that they're doing to us that we can't stop here. Okay? Now, now in this book, I quote Madison several different times, but he said, we can safely rely on the disposition of state legislatures to erect barriers against the encroachment of the national authority. Well, that's where it is. And we can rely on the county commissioners to do the same thing. They are political subdivisions of the state, and I didn't make that up either, because that's exactly what Scalia says in this case. Now I gotta ask, or Arlene, how much longer do I have? 10 minutes? No, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I shouldn't have asked her. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do one other thing here. We're gonna go all the way to the back and show you what the, the end decision, keep, keep going, just keep going. I'm gonna show you what's, what the bottom line order was from the court. Keep going. Wait, keep going. Right there, no, go back, right there. Okay, this is, the, this is the order of the court after Scalia takes us through this wonderful lesson. And, and again, make sure, if nothing else, you take one of these home tonight. But I hope you'll take it all with you because it all fits into this solution that Scalia has showed us here. Start, with, start in the gold with me, okay? The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems, nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. Does that stop Obamacare? Yes. Where do we stop Obamacare? Here. Let me tell you something about Obamacare. I will never, under any circumstance, use, borrow, utilize, or take Obamacare ever. And I will tell my sheriff that I will expect him to protect me when they come after me, including any IRS fines that they might levy towards me. I will not pay that. And if it takes me to jail, well, I hope some of you are there with me. You know? <laughs> Next one. It matters not whether policy making is involved and no case-by-case -case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. Now there's one other thing here. My favorite quote from this whole decision says this. <clears throat> the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. That's in this decision, folks. From the United States Supreme Court, we have what all of us have dreamed about. Somebody actually saying the purpose and the intent and the power of the Constitution. Do you know that if you have local officials that know and understand that one sentence, we get our freedom back tomorrow. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. Now I want to close, and I do this the same no matter where I am. I close the same way. And it's all derived from Dr. Skousen at that police training. Remember the police training? At one point, he had 240 of us, big tough cops, get up and he taught us a little kindergarten exercise. And I never forgot it. And when he handed me his book, he said, promise me, Officer Mack, promise me that you'll teach these things to your children. And I promised him, and I have. And now I teach them all across the country. I must have a lot of children. <laughs> but I've also tar started teaching them to my grandchildren. And the oldest one will be five in a couple of weeks. You see, she was born on the 4th of July. And her name is Liberty. And so to my little Liberty and to yours, and to dedicate this to you and the other people who will make us free and my grandchildren and yours free, I dedicate this to Judge Roll and to Dr. Skousen, God rest their souls. And I dedicate this to the Founding Fathers who made it all possible for us to be here and to you and each of you I want to share with you what I call America's political prayer. And remember, 
I learned this at police training. And it goes like this. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And that's the eagle. Long may she be free. Thank you. We have this special award for Sheriff Mack. It says, Defender of Freedom Award, Eagle Form of California 2011. Thank you very much. <laughs>